I'm really delighted to welcome Steve here tonight. He came all the way in from Colorado where there's another snowstorm hitting tonight. So he's very, very happy to be in Tucson where we haven't had snow in quite a while. Um, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Lexon. So is everything working? Okay, this is working, that's working. This is working, everything's working, it was great. Ray Thompson, when he said I was lazy and a cheapskate, did it in a long poem. I don't know if you knew Ray Thompson, a wonderful man and a superb poet of the oh, sort of pithy side of poetry, <laughs> zingers. Um, anyway, yeah, it was my pleasure to know him, and my privilege to know him uh, when I was down here in the past. So I've been retired for about a year. I'm done with this stuff, with that. Um, but a, uh, an author friend of mine uh, who's written some good nonfiction books about Southwest archaeology, a guy named Dave Roberts. Uh, he uh, searched of the ancient ones and once they rode like the wind and you, you may have read some of his stuff. Uh, he made me promise to write my memoirs. And I'm, which is, so I'm working on it, but I'm not going to publish them, but I'm just, it's sort of interesting to think about. And, uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm not really in the game uh, these days. Well, I am a little bit. But it occurred to me that I kind of dropped a big one every 10 years or so, <laughs> starting in 86 with Great Polo Architecture Chaco Canyon, which would have been a game changer if anybody had actually read it. <laughs> you know, they all looked at the pictures and the, ch and the charts and stuff, and they didn't actually read it. And I'll get back to that in a minute. And then 99, I think called Chaco Meridian, and in 2009, History Ancient Southwest, and 2018 study of Southwestern archaeology. Um, the first and the last, the first is all about Chaco, the last um, uses Chaco as an example. The other two are all over the map. Chaco's just a bit player. But I'll start off tonight with the mystery of Chaco Canyon. Um, I'm sort of annoyed with my field um, because we want everything to be a mystery, especially Chaco. Uh, we've been working out there, okay, I mean, I'm talking about archaeologists, all right, Southwestern archaeologists who might love like brothers and sisters, but doesn't mean I, I can't be annoyed with them. Um, archaeology has been going on in Chaco Canyon for over 100 years. Big projects, big projects, you know, millions of bucks, mostly your bucks, all right, and, and lots of energy and brains, bright people out there and lots of, lots of hard work, and the archaeology is really easy. I mean, compared to just about any place in the world, it's wonderfully easy. They didn't build a city on top of Chaco. It's all right there. It's not like Phoenix, you know, where they built, or this place, where they built a city on top of Hohokam. It's all right there. Uh, you have, it's the best dated site in the world, prehistoric site in the world, with all those tree ring dates. There are tens of thousands of tree ring dates. You can see most of everything right on the surface, which is a lie, you know, every time you stick a shovel in the ground or something uh, alarming. But the archaeology is really easy, okay? So we've been doing this for 100 years, spending lots of time and money on it, and it's a mystery? I mean, this is embarrassing. This should be embarrassing for Southwestern archaeology. It's not, I don't think it's a mystery. It's a mystery because we, and I'll get back to this, because we want it to be. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Chaco. Everybody's been to Chaco, right? Or seen it on TV or something like that? It's a park because of these things, these great houses. Um, this is a, who did this one? Not Adriel Heisey, but... Um, an aerial Chetra kettle where uh, uh, Museum of New Mexico and University of New Mexico uh, back in the 30s and 40s dug about two-thirds of that place and didn't write it up, so I did. Um, in 86, when I was working for the Park Service, I didn't have a PhD, I was just a you know, Park Service punk, um, I realized I was working for a thing called the Chaco Project and we were out digging sites like that one uh, and lots of other sites and all the archaeologists were honed in on the architecture of stratigraphy of 29 SJ 629, okay, which needed to be honed in on, or the ceramics, or the lithics, or the botany, or whatever. Nobody was looking at the big houses. And I said, well, you know, this is why it's a park. This is why we're out here. This is why it's a Chaco phenomenon, are those big buildings. So I, I talked my boss into letting me do this. He you know, didn't have a lot of time. Uh, and I had a little, little bit of a budget. This is park service. We actually had money, <laughs> unlike many of my other projects. Um, in 86, and three things, you know, if people actually read this, not you guys, but my <laughs> colleagues, uh, there's, there's a bunch of little, tiny little bombshells, because I was, I didn't have a PhD, I was working for the Park Service, nobody paid attention to it. 
you know, you have to have a PhD for them to pay attention to you. And I was very understated at the time, because uh, I knew I didn't have a PhD, and you know, had my hat in my hand, and I was sort of humble about all this stuff. But three things that came out of that was great houses are mostly storage. They're mostly storage facilities. You saw the great you know, um, Chetra Kettle, hundreds of rooms, most of those are storage rooms. The entire canyon was the site. It wasn't Chetra Kettle as a site, or Benito was a site, Pueblo Benito was a site. The whole place was a site, and it was sort of urban. Um, and the difference between, I'll, I'll show you this in a minute, the, the conundrum at Chaco since the 1930s, since Florence Holly Ellis figured this out, is on one side of the canyon you have these great big great houses, on the other side of the canyon you have all these little bitty things, I'll show you those in a minute, which they call towns and villages, or, or great houses and small sites. Those represent social classes. People have tried all kinds of different ways to explain why, you know, these, they're contemporary, they're at the same time. You know, what's going on with this, where you have these great big building, flashy buildings and these little scrawny things that, you know, unless you're an archaeologist, you just walk over it, you wouldn't even know it's a building. They're social classes. You got elites and you got commoners. So the storage thing, um, it's all about the doors. When I was looking at the, at the great houses, I got to crawl all over them. Uh, Pete McKenna and I drew, measured and drew every wall out there and, and you know, we were part of a team that, that resampled a lot of the wood that was out there for dates. But on the second and third floors, there's no floor anymore. So the archeologists throw up their hands and say, we can't say what happened in this room. Sure you can, you got the doors and the doors are really, you know, they're diagnostic. Um, storage doors, if you've been to Chaco, the storage doors are like this thing over here where they're up, you, I'm gonna go behind a pillar here, none of you can see what I'm doing. Um, they're up away from the floor, they're small, there's pictures of them there, all right. Um, almost all of them have, eh, you aren't gonna be able to see it real well, but that one there, uh, secondary jams, where if I'm a door, there's inside the door, there's these two jams that go up like this and a secondary lintel. And that's so you could put a, a, a plank over that and mud it all up and seal it like a, a cork in a wine bottle. That's why they're small. You know, talk to some warehouse guys about this. Oh yeah, that's what it's that's all about. It's, it's so you can seal off whatever's in that room, come back three years later and the mice won't have eaten it. Um, and almost all the doors in Chaco are storage doors, except for the big T doors. And those are mostly doors into apartments, into places where people are living. You know, from the outside, so they're visible from the outside. That's going to be important later. When you walk through Pueblo Benito, which many of you have done, um, uh, this is an iconic shot of Pueblo Benito where you have all these doors lined up. Uh, Neil M. Judd out of the uh, National Geographic Society did you all a favor and artificially dropped the, the sill so you can get through this door. <laughs> Originally, these were all like that up there. That was like that. So you know, these, these walk-through doors that you see at Chaco are a product of the archaeologists trying to be kind to, to people that are visiting. Um, where you see these little doors with these secondary jams and secondary lintels are in all the little granaries in southeastern Utah and southwest Colorado where you have some little crack in the, in the, uh, the canyon wall and they put this tiny little thing up there with one of these storage doors. Nobody's living in that. You know, for one thing, you can't even get to it. it needs a technical. You know, well, this one, I don't know this one well, but you know, many of these, you need to be a technical climber to get to them. So nobody's living in those things. They're storing stuff in it. So that's why I'm saying, yeah, it's a storage door. Is you know, that's what you see on the, what they call the uh, granaries. These guys are the <laughs> the people doors, at least on the exterior walls. The big T doors, and we're going to come back to T doors a couple times here. Okay, so. Looking at the doors and you know, going through and mapping every wall and every opening in those, wa those walls, all the sites out there, almost all those rooms are storage rooms. You know, there's very few people actually living in that place and the people who live in there are really special people. Um, my second point was that the Chaco isn't, a, you know, it isn't Pueblo de Aurora is one site and Benito's in one other site and oh, what is that, Pinasco Blanco is another site. They're all part of a, uh, a complex that uh, Gordon, uh, Gordon Fritz, I'm forgetting Fritz's first name, um, fellow figured out years ago was actually laid out. There's, just, there's symmetries and stuff out there where Benito and, and Chetra Kettle are symmetrical around a north-south axis. And, and then all those small sites are, are in there too. And the whole place is a, the whole place is a site. It's, these are different buildings in the site. It's like Pompeii, I mean, not much smaller. I mean, I'm saying it's, kind of urban, you know, maybe 3,000 people out there, but in many, most periods of human history, that's a city. 
You know, when you think of city, we think of New York or Paris. Most cities aren't that big back in the day. Okay, the classes. You got the great houses, and then right across the canyon, when, when my colleagues say, Lexington, where's your evidence for this? I say, walk through Pueblo Benito, walk across the bridge, and look at what they call the BC sites, which many of you have seen right across the canyon. These were excavated by uh, UNM back in the day, in the 30s. BC doesn't mean before Christ. It's a, just record keeping for how they dealt with dots on a map. But the B, what the BC sites are, and these are almost a scale, uh, you know, approximately, um, are rows of five rooms and a kiva, five rooms and a kiva, five rooms and a kiva, five rooms and a kiva. That's a, that's a family house. It's called a unit pueblo, and it's been recognized since the 20s in the Four Corners that it's almost like a rubber stamp. Five or six rooms, you know, not always five. You know, four rooms, five rooms, six rooms, and a kiva is a family house. It's a unit pueblo. You could pick up one of those unit pueblos, not the whole you know, cluster of them, but one of them and drop it in a single room. Pueblo Benito, okay? People are living in this, people are living in that. There are different kinds of people. Uh, Gwen Vivian, who some of you may know, wonderful man, um, he tried to argue that there are different ethnicities. He had one ethnic group living in these little things, another ethnic group, and he's right, because when you read about how uh, class distinctions were considered in ancient America, <laughs> they were different kinds of people. Nobles are one kind of person, commoners are another kind of person. Nobles are divine. Commoners are commoners, all right? When you read the histories, which are written by the nobles, everybody's fine with that. <laughs> I don't know if the commoners are fine with that or not, but um, that's what you got at Chaco, and it's just crystal clear uh, if you get your head out of the fog, which I'll talk about in a minute, of art wanting everything to be like a modern Pueblo. Um, the nobles are living, you know, not many in these, these palaces, which is what you'd call them anywhere else in the world. Commoners are living in just normal little houses, like everybody else, the other 99% of the people in the Four Corners in the 11th and 12th century. They live in those little things. Okay, uh, when you talk about nobles and commoners in the Southwest, everybody, you know, has heart attacks. Um, everybody from Florida to, to California, when Chaco's going strong, had nobles and commoners. You know, and from Panama, well, and for the South too, but from Panama North, any, every place they grew corn, they had nobles and commoners. I mean, we know this from the archeology. span uh, Chaco's in the middle of it. It would be remarkable if Chaco did not have nobles. This is an extraordinary claim. This is the way life was lived in the 11th and 12th century in North America with, the, with those classes and maybe more, you know, priestly classes, whatever, whatever. Okay, come back to that. Adding on to that, I was involved with a lot of what they called the outlier hunts, which is some of the products of that, back in the, in the 80s, um, where we realized that there were sites outside of Chaco that looked an awful lot like those great houses. Most of them were smaller. It's like you took a 20th of Pueblo Benito, picked it up in a, in a helicopter, and dropped it in the middle of a bunch of unit Pueblos. And so all these dots on the map, I didn't do all of them, but I've been to a lot of those. Um, there's about six of us that ran around finding these small great houses out there and putting dots on the map. Um, at the same time, people were investigating roads, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. The, the red lines uh, are what, we call them roads because you don't know what else to call them. They look like a road. I, I don't know if they're roads like, they're certainly not roads like Speedway. Um, so there's a region. There's a region with a clear center that the roads lead back to. You know, that Chaco's 2,000 people, 3,000 people, something like that. The next biggest settlement is 200, 300, I mean, there's a clear, you know, there's a middle to this. There's a capital. Um, there's a region with stuff like that. I mean, this is, I worked at the Bluff Great House. It was my wife, Kathy Cameron's, that was her project, but I was co-PI for a while, which is about as, no, not, we found some more, but it's about as far northwest as these things get. And then Chimney Rock, I got to work there near Pagosa. If you've never been to Chimney Rock, go. It's really cool. Um, uh, that's about as far northeast as they get. And I'm talking about this at dinner. Uh, <laughs> finally got to see Camelot and the San Augustine, which I'm ask me later and question and answer. I'll tell you where that name comes from. I didn't name it. Uh, we the, inherited the name. That's about as far as southeast as they go. And I've never, in the southwest, I, you know, I don't really have a good feel for that. And they almost get down to this part of the world. But if you, if you put all this stuff together, you got a class society living in those palaces, 
uh, the center is pretty much urban, pretty much a capital, and by anybody's definition, the capital of a large region. That's a big region. That's the size of Indiana, all right? This thing is sitting in the middle of it. I mean, this is not rocket science. You got a polity. You have a political entity. And again, this is, you know, like nobles and commoners and palaces. This is a word you never use in the Southwest, all right? It's just, I say that at a meeting and people have fits. However, it's true. <laughs> so in, in 99, um, I wrote a book about centers of political power in the ancient Southwest. And this book, I'm, I'll show you in a minute, I'm, I'm talking about how there's a sequence of centers, sequence of capitals, and they just happen to be on the north, not, they don't just happen to be on the north-south line, they did that intentionally. But everybody picks up on the north-south part of it and has, has fun with that. But what I was really trying to get across in this book is there was a political history in the ancient Southwest, and it plays out um, over the landscape, where, just for starters, Chaco uh, comes online about 850, and they quit building out there about 1125. Again, we have all these tree ring dates. I mean, archaeology is easy. Um, Aztec, straight north from there, more or less. Uh, Aztec ruins is a national monument. Is everybody? It's not really Aztec. You know, the local guys, the local farmers named it Aztec. But it's, it's the second capital. It's just like Chaco with these great houses, about half as big um, in, in is the total city. But it's the new Chaco. It, it comes online about 1110, and it ends about 1275, which is when everybody leaves the Four Corners. Tens of thousands of people leave the Four Corners. Uh, this includes Mesa Verde. I mean, Mesa Verde was part of Aztec's region. I'll show you that in a minute. And we know that they were linked because they wrote it on the ground. This is a road. It's actually not the Great North Road. This is truth in advertising, but it, that's what a road looks like. It's a, about uh, you know, 30 feet wide, straight as an arrow, and it's cut and fill. I mean, they build these things. This isn't people beating a, you know, walking a trail into the, the ground surface. They actually build these things. And there's the Great North Road that runs from Chaco north to Aztec. So it's, you know, it's connecting two things that are not even contemporary. Chaco's first, Aztec's second, and then there's a road between them. What's that all about? Well, B is connected to A. You don't have writing. You put a monument on the ground that shows, yes, B is legitimized by, uh, by monumenting its, its history back to, uh, to Chaco. The roads are, have many different uses, but this one, yeah, one of its uses for sure is linking the new capital to the old capital, un unambiguously. Plus, the roads are a lot of work. Everybody has to go out there. Everybody, you know, what are we doing this for? Oh, because they're building a new capital. And they're maintained. You know, every once in a while, they sweep them off. So Junior goes out there, and he says, what's this all about? Oh, it's because this is the new capital. This is the old capital, and we need to refresh this. Um, Aztec ruins. This is a Dennis Holloway uh, guy in Albuquerque. Reconstruction of Aztec ruins. Earl Morris, whose job I had until I retired, um, dug Aztec West, for those of you that have been there. There's an equally large one called Aztec East, which hasn't been excavated. In a, you know, a couple other big great houses, and one up on the uh, uh, terraces behind called Aztec North. Um, so you got the great houses. The new element is tri walls. The whole thing's laid out around these buildings that are concentric walls with something in the middle <laughs> a tower or a kiva, I don't know. Um, but if you see this, you know, this is at an oblique angle, if you see this from straight up top, the, the axes of, of, of uh, Aztec go from um, Hubbard Mound to this unexcavated, actually four-walled central thing, that's the center of the whole, the whole town, to that great kiva, and then from, I think it's called the Earl Morris Ruin, through the, the central kiva to uh, tri-wall, quadra-wall to that great kiva. And you know, through the middle of that is a road going up to Aztec North. So it's, it's laid out like Chaco is laid out. I mean, there, there's a plan there. It's not just random, they're not just throwing these things here and there. They're there because they're there. Triwalls are, <laughs> they had one that was excavated at Aztec and they filled it back in, so it's a little hard to convey what they, what they look like, but um, that was one that uh, I think Holmes saw in the you know, late 19th century. It still had standing walls. Uh, Crow Canyon dug one at uh, Yellow Jacket and it has a, actually a tower. The center part was a tower. So it was like a wedding cake, if you can figure, you know, envision that. That's one at Chaco, there is one at Chaco, it was about the last thing they ever built there. That is a Hubbard Mount, I think, at uh, Aztec. But these things are important, they're gonna come up again. So when I say tri-wall, you know what I'm talking about. 
Okay, so um, Chaco Meridian got me in all kinds of trouble. And uh, you know, initially, the guys that worked in the middle San Juan where Aztec is were just furious. They were livid. They said, Aztec has nothing to do with Chaco. And they were going to hang me from the nearest oak tree. Um, these days, when I talk to graduate students and I say, boy, that was a real fight to get people to recognize the Chaco moved to Aztec, it was. <laughs> you know, it's, that's accepted, pretty much. There's still a few holdouts. But, who cares? Um, yeah, that, that part of uh, the Chaco Meridian is accepted. The Chaco moved to Aztec and the North Road is part of the history. So writing that book, I, was, I, was, I never used the word history in Chaco Meridian, but that's what I was doing. Because history is a, another forbidden word. Don't ask me why. Um, but it is. You can ask me why in question and answers, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> I decided, what the, what the heck? Archaeology should be history. So I wrote a narrative history of the ancient Southwest, and that came out in 2009, which, you know, in which Chaco plays a small, a, a big role, but it's only one of many players. Um, in writing that book, in trying to figure out how to write, you know, how do you write history for something that has no documents? How do you do that? Well, I figured out that what we had been doing, because archaeology in, the, in North America has been situated in anthropology, Okay, I originally wanted to be a classical archaeologist. When I went to college, they wouldn't let me do that. I said, well, I'd like to be an archaeologist. Go over to anthropology. What's anthropology? I didn't know. I still couldn't tell you, really. I mean, I don't know what anthropology is. But because we were in anthropology, and cultural anthropologists had spent so much time in the Pueblos, and they were, they were kind of uh, driving the wagon of anthropology. The cultural anthropologists thought they were really important, and they were. Um, Archaeology has always looked at cultural anthropology, the ethnologies of Taos, or what some, a book somebody wrote about Zia, or something like that, taken bits and pieces of that, whatever they needed, and moved it back into the past to explain what that is, and turn it into a Pueblo, Pueblo Benito. Uh, it's called upstreaming, which, if you think about that, it's clinically nuts. I mean, time doesn't work this way from the present to past, time works that way. And our job should be, as archeologists, to figure out how the heck that came out of something like this. They're so different. They don't have nobles and commoners. They don't have palaces. They aren't capitals of regions. I mean, they being Pueblos today. They don't do any of that stuff. So what happened here that ends up like that? That's our job, is to move forward from the past not from the, past, from the present to the past. This, <laughs> this is me on a bad day. Um, say the red things, say, are big events. You know, volcanoes blowing up or Chaco or something like that. And you do have, you know, there is a line of history, but there's all kinds of things that didn't make it. Things, that, you know, things in the past that didn't make it into the present, the dead ends. And then you have something from the outside, some curveball uh, from Mesoamerica, just deflecting everything. And, and you know, somebody, this is... <laughs> to get the punchline away, people making a decision to take themselves off that trajectory. All right, that might make more sense in a minute here. Yeah, next slide. The, the modern Pueblos are a reaction against and a rejection of Chaco. And they remember this, they talk about it. That they were at Chaco, it was wonderful. I'm, I'm paraphrasing an account from, from Akama. It was amazing. Uh, there's all these macaws, and everybody was wealthy. Well, there's some wealthy people. And then uh, people got, and this is a quote, people got power over people. Nobles, all right? That wasn't right. And their spiritual advisors said, this stinks. Leave this place, relocate to Akama, and reinvent yourself. Don't ever do this again. And um, talking to guys from the Rio Grande Pueblos, and mostly guys and some women, Rio Grande Pueblos, they know, uh, I was working at a museum in New Mexico and trying to uh, do an exhibit on Chaco and a couple of guys from two different Pueblos that were working with us uh, came up to me and said words to this effect, that we know all about Chaco, we don't talk about it because bad things happened there. And I've talked to people more recently from Rio Grande Pueblos who say, yeah, we hate the place. I mean, that, that's a quote. We hate the place. Horrible things happened out there. What happened out there? Well, probably some horrible things, but the the thing that they did reinvent themselves was getting rid of the nobles. You don't have that in Pueblos. Pueblos are, they're not egalitarian. There's all, you know, there are people who are making decisions and their families are more important and that kind of stuff, but they don't have kings. They don't have nobles. 
they mostly have old guys, very important old guys, who I shouldn't describe as old guys, that sounds disrespectful, but they make decisions and they say, you're gonna be the governor, and so you're the governor for a year, and it costs you money to do that. <laughs> you, know, you don't enjoy it, you're doing it because you're a good member of that village. They rejected Chaco, and again, you know, they talk about this stuff. Okay, so here's this, to me, really obvious archeology. span I mean, if you took Chaco and dropped it anywhere else in the world, oh yeah, it's a little, it's a little state. It's, you know, we've seen those a million times. But we don't like it, we, we have the mystery of Chaco Canyon where it's something woo-woo, something different, because of what I'm calling Pueblo space. When I got to thinking about this, when I was getting near the end of my career, I said, well, you know, let's go two ways. We're all idiots or we were poorly trained. We were poorly trained. I mean, I know my colleagues, they're not idiots. They're not all idiots. <laughs> don't, don't tape that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, no, they're, they're, you know, they're smart, smart people. But we were all trained to think about upstreaming, about coming from Pueblos back to the past, and that way you never see Chaco. You know, those guys can go out there and they don't see Pueblo Benito. They don't see the differences between that. I mean, it's amazing. Um, that led to this, where the first third of this book, this is the last thing I'm going to write in Southwestern Archaeology. Uh, first third of this is a, a history of where Pueblo space came from. It didn't come from, anthrop well, it came from anthropology, some of it, but it has many fathers and mothers. Uh, Ruth Bendix, an anthropologist, John Gomes, an architect. Fred Harvey, you know, ran the, the hotels along the railroad. Uh, Charles Lummis is a uh, journalist. Edgar Hewitt's archaeologist. Mabel Dodge Lujan was, you know, a lady that knew a lot of, of uh, artists in Taos, <laughs> put it mildly. <laughs> uh, and these are not all the people, but it, 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 it's a long story I'm not going to tell tonight. If you're interested in this, check out from the library, you don't have to buy, um, the study of Southwest Archaeology. The first two chapters are about this, and it's actually interesting. And I'll tease you, I won't tell the whole story, but the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad didn't go to Santa Fe. <laughs> Why would they go to Santa Fe? <laughs> it was this, you know, it was just this tiny little, you know, town full of mud houses and flat roofs and dirt streets. And yeah, it was the old, it was the capital of New Mexico. Big deal. <laughs> you know, nobody wanted New Mexico. When you know, we wanted to take New Mexico, so we could get to California in the, in the Mexican War. You know, it was just sort of a byproduct of that war. That uh, the railroad went through Albuquerque, and so Albuquerque becomes the progressive town in. New Mexico, this is late 1900s, 19th century, excuse me, late 19th century. They get the, the university, goes to Albuquerque. Santa Fe gets the penitentiary. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anyway, there's a lot of this stuff in the book that there is actually a move in New Mexico to move the capital from Santa Fe to Albuquerque, because why not? I mean, Albuquerque was the common place. They had gas, you know, they paved streets, gas lights, all that kind of stuff, and Santa Fe was just a mess. Um, and the guys in Santa Fe didn't like it, like Edgar Hewitt. He's, the, he's a kingpin in all this stuff. And they said, well, we can't fight them with industry because they got the industry, and we can't fight them with you know, uh, progressive stuff because we're not progressive. And we, we, all we have is our cultural stuff. You know, we're very traditional. And they, they tried Spanish traditions. They're, they're gonna market to keep, uh, nationally, to keep Santa Fe the capital of New Mexico. And they tried Spanish conquistadors and nobody, nobody's buying. We just, you know, at this point, we just fought a war with Spain. We didn't hear that stuff. So they drive back 10 yards and they said, Indians, we'll do Indians. I mean, they, they actually, you know, there's like 20 guys, white guys, maybe less than that, who are, who are thinking about this stuff. And they said, well, we can't do Apaches and Navajos because we fart in wars with them. Uh, we'll do the Pueblos. They're cool. And so they make the Pueblos into this exotic something other deal, you know, that people from back east can come, Fred Harvey does this, um, can go see this, you know, mystical Zen gardeners playing flutes. <laughs> So, and this is cooked up, you know, the, the Pueblos are watching all this. I mean, I, I, I've talked to some Pueblo people about this, but, you know, the guys you need to talk to are dead. They, you know, they were there in the late 19th century. You know, what do they think about all this? Um, what they come up with is Pueblo space where every Pueblo is an independent village. Uh, they're all communal and egalitarian. They're ritual and spiritual. They're eternal and unchanging. This is really something because they're doing all this in between World War I and World War II. World War I was just a real mess, not so much for us, but for Europe. I mean, it was a mess for us. We got a lot of guys killed, but, but you know, it was just a time of the, the rise of dictators. It was just a, a rough time. So the unchanging part was something that people were looking for. Uh, exceptional and unique. There's nothing else like them in the world. 
None of this applies to Chaco, not a bit of it, except maybe ritual and spiritual, I have no idea. I don't think anybody does. But the rest of it, independent villages, no. Those are, those are, are palaces and, and houses in a city. Communal egalitarian, don't think so. Nobles and commoners, let, let ritual and spiritual go. Eternal unchanging, no, there's history. I mean, there's history there where stuff changes. You know, Chaco moves Chaco, you know, to Aztec, Aztec falls. Just rises and falls. Exceptional and unique, only if you say so. Okay, for it, sure, you know, pueblos are unique in the sense that every, kind, every culture is unique, but that whole package that I showed you for Chaco is just a small state that we see, you know, we see in Mesopotamia, we see in Mesoamerica, we you see it all in archaeology again and again and again. So to keep Chaco in Pueblo space, you have one group that's trying real hard to say that Pueblo Benito is a farming village. They're working real hard at this. And this is, this is Gwen, Chip Wills, these are both friends of mine. Um, okay, there's another group, that's most of us, that says you can't really grow corn out there. <laughs> and in my opinion, you really can't, at least not for five, you know, 3,000 people. Um, Jim Judge, my boss at the Park Service Chaco Project, came up with the idea it's a pilgrim center. So you have this whole big thing that's elaborate, but it's empty. So you don't have to worry about feeding them. Uh, Norm Yaffe, who's a, a pal of mine in Drennan, who I know uh, reasonably well, Dick Drennan, uh, came up with rituality. What does that mean? I mean, I, nobody can tell me what that means. And uh, most recently, <laughs> to bring it, to, to keep it in the anthropology, I'm trying to get it out of anthropology, because I think anthropology is just uh, a sea anchor on this. It's not letting us move forward. Uh, people are bringing in Claude Levi, Levi Strauss, who's a very famous French anthropologist of the first half of the 20th century with house societies and applying it to Chaco and saying, oh, it's, it's, it's not a state, it's house societies. Well, when you go back and read what, oh, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here. What, what Levi Strauss is talking about with house societies was like uh, the house of Windsor. <laughs> That's what he meant. You know, and, and we've taken Levi Strauss's, because his name is holy in anthropology, and gotten rid of that part of it and, and kept some other stuff he said about it where a house is a moral person and, you know, the, all the stuff in French that nobody can understand. Um, but what Levi Strauss ri originally meant was, yeah, palaces. A house is a palace. His houses. Um, so, anyway, here's, here's where I get in trouble and people get annoyed with me, but... If, if your history is flawed, you're going to spend a lot of NSF money and do silly science. And I don't know how many uh, NSF proposals I've reviewed, National Science Foundation proposals I've reviewed, that start off with, we know that Chaco was an intermediate society, which is anthropology jargon for not a state. It's an intermediate society. Therefore, you know, X, Y, and Z. And sitting there reading these things going, what if that isn't, you know, what if we don't know that? What if we don't know there was an intermediate society? What if it was a state? How would that change your research? And always, it would change it enormously. It would change you know, what you need to do to answer your question. It would probably change the answer to your question uh, on a, a proposal to do research. So I, I think we've been asking for 100 years because we were poorly trained. And you know, it starts off with Hewitt and those guys, and they train people who train people who train people who train me. So now it's, you know, it's in the water. It's baked in. Uh, we've been asking the wrong questions and getting basically irrelevant answers. This makes me not very popular with my panels. Um, so let's get back to how to write a, a history for, for prehistory. Pre meaning, you know, no written records. It doesn't mean they didn't have history. It's just the historians don't want to deal with it because there's no written records. You can do bottom up or top down, uh, at least in, in archaeology. What do I mean by that? Um, here's a great example of amazing bottom-up stuff that's being done right here. Actually, right over there. Um, with Barbara Mills, who many of you may know, in the School of Anthropology. Matt Peoples, he's up at ASU and in Archaeology Southwest, which of course is Bill Doley's wonderful organization. Um, where they're doing, they're doing big data in, in the, the true sense of that term, where you get so much information that you can't deal with it in your head. You know, you've got to do algorithms, and you got to do machine stuff with it. Um, they've got information. Barbara's got shirred counts and, and obsidian data and all that stuff from many, 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 many sites. This is from 1100, 1150. And then they, they do algorithms on it. Uh, they don't do it. The machine does it. That shows how connected those sites are. And if you want to learn more about that, you should invite Barbara to give you a talk. I hope she probably has, because 
she'd be very, you know, it'd be an interesting talk. This is cool stuff. It took them years and lots of NSF money. And you know, that's not, this is not an indictment. It's just, you know, this took a lot of work, a lot of work to, get, to gather up all this information they got from different time periods. So, you know, they can go through time and these, these things change, these, these uh, webs. Uh, the, the red dots, obviously, are sites. Uh, webs change. Okay, that's a bottom up, all right? I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of money. So I'm interested in top down. So you got Barber's patterns that, I don't have a pointer, but Chaco's the mess in the middle there. And it kind of looks like the northern San Juan, you know, and all the southern stuff in the uh, southern San Juan Basin and down into Arizona. Probably aren't, they don't have much to do with each other. Which is, you know, that's, that's what her information is showing her, which is really cool. Because coming top down, they do have something to do with each other. When, when the capital moves to Aztec, its signature are tri walls. You know, the whole town of, or city of Aztec is built around tri walls. And then you get tri walls out here and out there and out there um, in an area like that. Well, thank you, sir. I'm not, still not going to get to Aztec. <laughs> but th thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, need to make me taller, too. So, th you know, this is, Barbara's got millions of, of pieces of data. I mean, this is hers, she's really got big data. This map that I'm showing you, this distribution of triwalls, I've got, I don't know, 20 or 30 pieces of data. But it's top-down data. And the two of them together, I think, are really interesting. That something's going on on a high level with the triwalls, that's not happening with the pottery. So that's cool. It doesn't negate what, I'm not arguing at all with what she's doing. I'm saying that there's two levels of stuff going on there that's really interesting. That's, you know, that's how you could probably write history is do it at different scales if you can afford to do it. You know, I can't afford to do that. So I don't do big data. I do large data. Buildings. Not many of them. <laughs> you know, there's about 200 outlier, Chaco outliers, and I've seen probably half of them, which is not, you know, 200 is, is not a big number compared to 3 million, uh, you know, pieces of information that, that Barbara has. Um, for, for big data, I, I keep coming back to architecture. One of the things that's interested me strangely lately are those T doors. All right? T doors. Uh, again, you could probably. You know, in the entire Southwest, there are maybe three or four hundred T doors. I'm just making that number up, but it's probably something like that. You could probably know each one of them personally if you wanted to. You could give them names. Um, they start out at Chaco, as far as we know, they start out at Chaco Canyon in the 11th and 12th century, and they're only in the great houses. And they're in the walls that open onto the plaza. And if you came into the plaza, you would see these big T doors, all right? Um, when Chaco moves to Aztec, so do T doors. All right. All of a sudden, you have a bunch of the 13th century. You have a bunch of T doors showing up at great houses, but they get democratized. That every cliff dwelling in Mesa Verde has a T door. Not well, not every. You know, somebody should check this. Not every cliff dwelling in Mesa Verde probably has a T door. A lot of them do, and they're very prominent. You know, they're right where you you know you come into the canyon, you look up the cliff dwelling. That's what you see. You see the T door. Oh, that's the T door people. They're part of that mob. They'll give me food, or you come in there and say, "That's the Tidor people, part of that mob." I'm going around the canyon. You know? <laughs> they don't. I don't like them. They don't like me. Um, they're pretty peculiar. I mean, there's not many places in the world that use that shape. There's Palenque down in uh, Mesoamerica has T openings, but they're tiny. And I think that's probably you know it's not impossible to independently invent a T shape. But these guys are clearly you know built on the Chaco model. I mean they're historically linked to Chaco. Um, but they get democratized. And then after 1300, Aztec falls apart. There's, there's a rise and fall. There's, there's a fall, Aztec falls apart. Tens of thousands of people leave the Four Corners. You know, they abandon them in the Four Corners. And you never see a Tidor again up in the Pueblo country. And they're all over Chihuahua. <laughs> uh, there's a couple, in, you know, a couple uh, along the Mogollon Rim, more, more than two. These are schematic. These aren't, you know. Accurate maps, schematic maps. Um, they're all over Pakime, Casas Grandes, which is the, cap, the third capital in the Chaco Meridian, which again comes online right after uh, Aztec Falls. 
And you know, they're very prominent at the, at the center, but there are also uh, T-doors in the uh, sites of the region, including cliff dwellings. And I got a chance to go down to uh, Sierra Madres uh, late last year. Oh, well, there's, there's a T-door um, at Pakime. And we went down and looked at cliff dwellings. I'd seen some of these cliff dwellings in the Sierra Madres. Uh, but we looked at a bunch that I hadn't, and, and the reports and the accounts are sort of iffy on these things. Uh, old photos, whatever, and I wanted to look for T-doors. And there actually is one right here. There's just half of it. The other half has fallen away. So here's a, here's a picture from Carl Lumholtz. He called it Garabato. Uh, today they call it Las Ventanas. And you can see a great big T-door. I mean, that's smack you in the face T-door. You're going to see that thing. There's nothing, nothing subtle about it. It's right up front. Uh, we got down to this one. I'd never been to this one before. I'd been to some of the other ones. But you know, I was looking across the canyon going and looking, and looking at Lumholz's pictures. And then, you know, we've got, got to be in the wrong place. We were in the right place. Oh, I'm sorry. We were in the right place. There's the T-door. It's just half a T-door. Again, one side of it's there. That's the great big T door, and the other side of it's fallen out. Um, oh, this is a, another T door. That's uh, um, Eduardo Gamboa, who was a Mexican archaeologist down there, and a woman who works for Ina down there, whose name I never did catch really. Uh, with a you know great big T door right up front. You come in, you know, you come into that canyon, you're gonna see that sucker. They're not in the back; they're right up front. They're, they're, okay. Just have to bear with me here. There are little T-doors, but I'm really interested in these big public T-doors. And sorry about this, but I just like this picture a lot. There's a, you know, I'm in there for scale. <laughs> okay, the T means something. Back in the day, even today, you go to Mesa Verde and depending on, on the ranger, they'll tell you, well, it's because they have a backpack on. Um, like they couldn't take the backpack off. Now the T-shape actually means something. Um, that's a Chaco T door, but the you know, Mesa Verde T doors. At Mesa Verde, they have these things uh, that we call mugs. That I don't have time to get into this, but they're they're not coffee cups. I mean, they're something. They're personal gear for medicine or something like that, because they're only at Mesa Verde. Nobody else makes them ever, and you know they're usually with burials, whatever. And in the handles of those, they'll cut T T uh, shapes. I mean, nobody's going through that handle with a backpack on. All right, <laughs> down at Pakime, this is Casas Grandes, Pakime. Uh, one of the rooms, and this isn't the nice one, uh, excuse me, one of the mounds that De Peso dug down there had a, um, a stone about like so, just perfectly cut, about like so, with a T opening in it. It was an altar. And nobody's going through that. Well, somebody might be going through that, but nobody you could see. You know? It's an altar with a T. The T means something. And it moves. It moves with the, with the polity. It moves with the, the shifting capitals. The T, the T shape. Um, I like it a lot. I think the history of T doors is the history that I mean, basically the political history of the ancient Southwest, or, or at least the Pueblo Southwest, um, where you know it started Chaco Canyon and they move up to Aztec ruins and then nobody makes them. Up. They reject Chaco. They being the Pueblo people, reject Chaco. They no more of those damn T doors. <laughs> those go with the nobles. Those go with that whatever that system was. They don't they don't want that anymore. So they don't do it anymore. But down here where you sure as heck have nobles. They, there's T's everywhere, T-shaped doors. Um, I don't know what time I started, so I don't, uh, how are we doing on time? You got another five minutes? Okay. The, okay, this other stuff is just things I've looked at fairly recently. Oh, that's actually in, in a book that came out in 2015. Whoops. It has to do with Pakime. And in town here, you got Paul Menace, who, who uh, with Mike Whalen, has done most of the important work on this thing. I mean, you've got experts. I, I've spent a lot of time down there. I've looked at sites, but I never dug down there. Um, that's the last cap in my book, maybe not in Paul's. Um, that's the last capital. Uh, and what, what comes after <laughs> Pakime? What comes before Pakime? I've been looking at some of the Spanish accounts. And, uh, when Juan de Oñate, there should be a tilde over there, uh, when Oñate uh, comes in and colonizes New Mexico, he's got the uh, Viagra, Gaspar Perez de Viagra, 
with them who writes a, a heroic poem about their journeys up in, you know, from central Mexico up to colonized Mexico, New Mexico. In uh, their, their column, I mean, this is armies and, you know, big Bermudas and cows and chickens and everything else. Um, they get to Casas Grandes and they're stunned because at that point it was standing even taller than it is today. And they, uh, they asked the locals, who built this? And we don't know who the locals were. It's probably not Taramar people, but you know, we don't know who those Indians are that they're talking to. But they say, beats us, you know, beats me. I don't know who built it. But there's stories. <laughs> they know some stories. And the way these, okay, now these are cast through Viagra's poetic imagination and the necessity of whatever iambic pentameter he was working with or whatever. But um, he says that the Indians tell him that Casas Grandes, there were two heroic brothers of high and noble kings descended, sons of a king and kin of the highest lineage that come marching out of the north. They're marching out of the north to the south. All right, and they have all their arm, you know, their armed men and their revenue, re, revenue, retinue. Okay, and they get to Casas Grandes, and they say, oh, they find they, they run into a, a witch. Uh, Viagra calls him the devil, calls her the devil, uh, but she's an old crone, and she's got a great big iron rock. So most certainly, she bore a huge, enormous weight, almost in form of a tortoise shell set upright of iron, massive and well-molded. Um, and she throws a stone, she drops a stone or she throws a stone, depending on which version you, you like. And she says, one to one brother, build a city here. The other brother, you can keep going, all right? And that's Pakime, all right? <laughs> this is being recorded in, I don't remember, uh, about 1600. All right, in the 1860s, there's a couple of guys from, Cas uh, Mexican guys from Casas Grandes who are out digging around in Pacimay looking for treasure, and they find that. It's a meteorite, and that's about life size. It's a, you know, a really famous, large meteorite. Uh, because it's a meteorite, uh, they find it when what they say is a temple, and it was wrapped up in cloth, all right? So they find this meteorite, and the meteorite winds up at a very devious route in the Smithsonian where it's treated as a meteorite. They cut it up and they, they analyze it for space stuff. Okay, <laughs> supposedly the city was founded where the witch dropped the large iron rock and then somebody digs it 300 years later and there's a large iron rock. That's really cool. I mean, I like the whole story. There's guys coming out of the north and you know, I like this part a lot. Okay, later, 1800, you got Alexander von Humboldt, who's a Prussian, uh, one of the last real, you know, great Enlightenment figures. Um, and he, he takes a trip through uh, a bit of South America and Mexico and winds up in Mexico City in 1803, where he uh, spends a lot of time at the uh, Royal College of Mining, which is like their USGS. This is before, well, Mexico is still a colony of Spain. So it's the Royal College of Mining. And they have, that's where they have all the old maps. And supposedly, I won't even try and pronounce this, but there's this collection of maps, part, just part of their collection, was pre-Columbian maps. You know, so they have all the old colonial, the oldest colonial maps, pre-Columbian maps, all, any map you want. And because von Humboldt is really famous at this point already, even though he's a young guy, every savant in Mexico City is leaning over his shoulder. And Mexico City at 1800 is an incredibly sophisticated place. I mean, it made Philadelphia at that time you know, look pretty rural. Um, so von Humboldt has the maps. He has everybody in Mexico City who knows stuff talking to him. And he produces, when he gets back to Europe, he produces a map of the Southwest, which is pretty good uh, if you look at this. Um, the latitudes are pretty good. Uh, the longitudes are off because it's hard to figure longitude. You know, before chronometers and stuff like that, it's hard to figure longitude. But the lat latitudes are pretty easy to fix. So he's, you know, he never made it to the Southwest. He never got to the Southwest. He's compiling this from the maps and what people are telling him. But it's a pretty accurate map. Um, and it's published 1810. So on it he has the first home of the Aztecs at a spot south of the San Juan and before it runs into the Colorado. Could be Chaco. Then he has the second home of the Aztecs, which is your Casa Grande up here. 
And then the third home of the Aztecs um, is Casas Grandes. And th those two are, you know, there's no doubt about those two. Okay, from the third home of the Aztecs, do I have this quote? Yes. He says, the third home of the Aztecs, uh, uh, the home of the Aztecs from which they passed through the Tarahumara country, the Sierra Madre, to this town here, Culhuacan, which is the modern town of Culhuacan. All right? Okay, so he had the latitudes right, the longitudes wrong. He didn't know that Chaco and Pakime and Culhuacan are due north south of each other. Um, I like this a lot. And I hinted at it in 1999. I, I actually come out and say it in 2015 in a second edition of Chaco Meridian. Um, that, yeah. They're, they're all, I mean, not, they're not exactly on a line. I mean, they're within, you know, five miles or whatever. But we're not, we're talking about people that are doing their surveying with a piece of string and a rock and, you know, naked eye. Um, I've been working with this young man, Michael Mathiewicz, who actually knows the archaeology around Culiacan and, and West Mexico. And he's convinced that there's a whole lot of, of links between Culiacan and Pakime, or, or West Mexico and, and Pakime. Um, and yeah, we won't get back to him, but just two more here. Um, Mike and I were talking about this. He was with, with us when we were in the Sierra Madres last fall, looking for T doors. Um, you got Viagra talking about two brothers coming from the north. You got um, uh, von Humboldt saying what must have been the uh, uh, consensus opinion of the intelligentsia of Mexico City at 1800, that the Aztecs came over the Sierra Madres to, from Pakime to Culiacan. I mean, he's not, he's not gonna make that stuff up. He's, he's seeing, it's either on maps or he's, he's hearing it, but this is, you know, this is direct information from Mexico City at 1800. Okay, going back in time, 1531, this is before Oñate, you got Nuno de Guzman, who's a real piece of work. He's a nasty guy. Um, he meets in Veracruz, I think, he meets a, a native who says, yeah, I'm a trader, my dad was a trader. We know where there's, the cities you guys are all looking for, I know where they are. We gotta go to Culiacan. And so, just on that word alone, uh, the guy must have been convincing. Nuno de Guzman raises an army and, you know, all the investment necessary for a big expedition, and comes rampaging up the west coast, just really being nasty. Uh, gets to Culiacan and wipes it out, uh, says, what next? And his guide says, now we go north. <laughs> if we go north from here, we'll, we'll reach the cities. Okay, and Guzman says, okay, but there's a whole Sierra Madres in the way, all right? You can go, uh, Taro Mars do this all the time. You, they, they, you can go on foot over that stuff. That's not, well, it'd be a problem for me, but it's not a problem for them. But Guzman has horses, he has carts, you know, he has all this stuff with him, he has herds. He, he goes blasting into the Sierra Madres and he does this for like three months and, you know, and giving up and coming back and trying again, and giving up, coming back. And finally, he gets in political trouble. They take him back to Mexico City. They put him in jail for something, you know, for something else altogether. Uh, so nothing ever happens. But this is, the, this is the first entrada. This is before Coronado. This is the first entrada in the Southwest is on the word of a native saying, my father used to tr trade with cities up there. He went to Culiacan and went north. If you go north from Culiacan, you get to Casas Grandes, which is over about the time Guzman's friend's father, well, his grandfather would have been alive. It's not ancient history. Um, so that's it. That stuff, if you're interested in following that up, is in here, which no one will ever read either. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and in, in studying Southwest archeology, span uh, you know, I've, that was my life's work, and my final thoughts on it are um, not happy thoughts, particularly. I mean, I think we a brilliant archaeologists doing wonderful work, but because we were trained in anthropology instead of history where we should have been, we screwed it up. Thank you. <laughs>Is my understanding we have questions and answers for? Yep. Um, I'll get to you a second, sir. Okay, so I'm kind of a big fan of the Chaco Meridian idea. Just got an article projected from the Southwest, and one of the reasons they said was, well, you know, too much of the 
Chuck over in the lady. So it looks nice, it looks nice on the map, but Von Humboldt also mentioned Casa Grande. Yes, yep. so you have which is not a straight line that doesn't pass through Casa Grande, no. so I wonder if you want to talk about that. In, in Need a Ouija board and get back in Mexico City at 1800. I don't know, you know, the, Casa, Casa Grande, both Casas Grandes and Casa Grande were well-known landmarks and monuments. And, you know, my guess is that, you know, they had to do something with it. <laughs> so you got this account of the, of, you know, the first home being up here, the second home being somewhere else, and the third home being uh, Casas Grandes from which, and this is where it gets specific, from which they, they you know, they go to Culiacan. I don't know. I mean, if this is easy. <laughs> History's not easy, let's put it that way. But no, it's a good point. Sir. I was interested in the way you tied the key doors into various places, but any speculation as to why the key door shape even existed? Uh, the question is why, why the key door shape? No, I don't know. Um, it's not because you're wearing a backpack. You know, um, and after that, no, I mean, it, it would, it's something you'd want to have that shape because it would be hard to close up in the winter. I mean, you know, you, it, it's not like you can, I mean, you, you could carpenter something T-shaped and that's not beyond these guys. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it, you know, it's a very uh, visible shape. It's on the exterior doors where people can see it. So it's announcing that you're part of whatever that group that uses the t doors, you're part of that. Now, I don't know what that means. I think I know what it means. I think you're, you're part of that political system. But, um, you know, it's obviously had meaning, but much deeper than that. You don't make an alt. I mean, assuming that thing was an altar at, at Casas Grandes, I mean, it, it meant something important. But um, I'll have to admit right now, I've never asked public people about that. And that would be an interesting ask, because, again, they, you know, they remember a lot about Chaco that they don't talk about because, you know, they don't, it's not something you talk about. It was not a good place. But I could ask some folks. Good question. Um, Chaco Canyon, you said that uh, many of the rooms there are actually storage. Yeah. So how do you reconcile or how do you configure few rich people or no nobility living there, not being an agrarian um, mm -hmm. assembly? What is it that you're storing in those rooms? I, I think they're storing food. I think they, they are bringing in food from all the places around. That They had a huge region. Most of it was much better farming land than Chaco, uh, especially the Chusca Valley. Um, you can carry very large amounts in a, a tump line. Um, instead of having backpacks like this, because these guys didn't have wheeled vehicles, no beast of burden, right? They're carrying it on their, on their backs. And actually, they're carrying it on their foreheads. Uh, the tump line goes up here, and then you have a big basket in the back. And you, I'm sure you've seen, there's whole compots that show rows of these guys with, with a, uh, backpack like that and a, and a staff. I think tump line economies were um, extensive during Chaco's time and Aztec's time. Not just corn, but all kinds of stuff is coming in. They, it, all the meat at Chaco, I mean, they can tell us chemically, the meat that these guys are eating is coming from somewhere else. It's not coming from Chaco. Uh, most of the pots that they find in Chaco, and it's, you know, they we're talking about hundreds of thousands of pots. They're not being made in Chaco Canyon. They're being made in Chusca Valley. And you can tell us again from the geology of the pot. And I think they're bringing in a lot of corn. Um, they probably didn't need a heck of a lot of corn because it's not, you know, it's only 3,000 people and they, and they can grow some corn in Chaco. One thing about the palaces is that nobody knows if there's anything in those rooms or not, right? You've got a great big warehouse and you can sit out front and say, I've got a great big warehouse, but nobody knows what's in there. So a lot of it could just be for show. You know, that you're, you're building for power. And, and that's what a lot of these buildings are, are to, they're building to impress, it's theater. When you come up on these buildings, they, it's architecture in the sense, you know, that somebody looks at it from the top of the plans, but also somebody's thinking about what does it look like when you walk up to it. And it would, if you lived in a unit Pueblo out in the edges of the Chaco region, and you followed a road into Chaco when you're 15, like everybody else did at 15, I'm making this up, 15, um, you would be scared out of your wits when you saw Pueblo Benito. I mean, there's nothing like that on the earth. It's a, it's a really, you know, it's not Versailles. <laughs> there's plenty of things like that on the earth, but as far as you knew, it, that's really impressive and they're, they're building to impress. Okay, I'm getting, getting around the question, but yeah, um, I think it's storing all kinds of stuff in there, uh, partly as a corn bank, so when somebody has a bad year over the Chuskas, you know, they can get some corn from Chaco. That's what rulers do. Um, but also, you know, just to uh, build volume. And you know, my, my storage, you know, my warehouse is bigger than your warehouse. Because there's, there's six of these major great houses. I think each had a, I can't really get into this now, but 
Um, this book gets into it. And I think they each had their own princely families and they're competing. It's sort of like, to think about uh, uh, some of those northern Italian towns in the late Renaissance where they had all these different families, the House of This, and the Capulets, the Montagues, whatever, and they're all competing by building bigger towers. Yeah, some, something like that. Sir. Yeah, there's uh, the Cherokee Indians have a little story too about how they used to have uh, these uh, priests and religious people that were <laughs> not and, uh, were uh, you know not behaving and were overthrown and some of them were killed yeah. and then they became with a more egalitarian society and not that far off years was. Uh, uh, He's talking about a similar uh, history in uh, uh, Cherokee. Yeah. Uh, Cherokee history. You've got it here too, with the Odom people. Uh, there's a wonderful book called "Short Swift Time of Gods on Earth" that talks about Odom stories about the you all know platform mounds, right? About the platform mounds that that uh, there are people that come in and they're living on the platform mounds and they're not Odom, okay? And they they set themselves up as rulers and they're oppressive and eventually they get together. With Itoi, with you know, with their hero figure, their their uh, hero figure is too uh, moderate a word for this guy. Um, but there's a there is they're describing a class revolt where they go to this pueblo mound and cut the, um, this platform mound and cut their heads off. They go to this platform mound and cut their heads off, and then they reinvent themselves as a society that doesn't have those guys anymore. <laughs> so I think yeah, this is probably not uncommon. So I think that's all the time we have for questions this evening. If you'll all join me in thanking Dr. Larson. Oh, thank you. I'll go ahead and bring the house lights up so everyone can see, but I'm sure he'll be available for a few minutes afterwards if you have a burning question. I'll say one more thing as a longtime member of this organization. It's a great organization. Thank you.